Mr. Billa, you set an ambitious target of doubling your group's revenues to $65 billion by 2015. To your mind, how realistic is that? So, um, just to put things in perspective, uh, Sri, we uh, were a $7 billion group uh, five years ago. Today, we're at $30 billion. And uh, I uh, am of the conviction that uh, the quality of your future actually depends on the quality of your imagination today. Uh, so, yes, it is a stretch target, but it's backed by concrete numbers, by plans, both uh, organic and inorganic. And, of course, there's a stretch built into it, which is the challenging part of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm very confident that we uh, would be able to achieve uh, a 65 billion number. How does this break up among your different businesses, uh, for example? So I think that the mix would remain more or less the same. So mm -hmm. very broadly speaking, I think uh, manufacturing uh, would uh, be about 70% of the portfolio. The balance would be uh, the service businesses, of, of course, on a much larger base, mm -hmm. so in absolute uh, terms, much larger. But I don't see that mix changing very much from what it is today. So acquisitions will have to necessarily be a very large part of this strategy. What are the geographies where we'll see the Birla Group you know, pushing ahead in the years ahead? So, you know, in the last 15 years, we've uh, had a presence all through in Southeast Asia. And because of some of the large uh, acquisitions in the last couple of years, we are pretty much uh, across the globe now. Half of our uh, turnover of 30 billion comes from outside of India. So uh, I think uh, the new geographies depend very much on the businesses that are making acquisitions. Acquisitive growth is going to be a very important part uh, of the growth story going forward. I think there are several very interesting economies. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Latin America, uh, Brazil, there's Southeast Asia, so let's say Indonesia, there's uh, parts of Africa. So I think uh, several new uh, emerging geographies uh, that are very interesting. Mm -hmm. We recently also forayed into East uh, uh, Europe. Very large presence now in North America. So I think we're pretty much across the mm -hmm. globe and very comfortable operating in different uh, cultural environments. How do you look at the global growth scenario? If you look at the world, you have the developed economy which are still in some sort of pain. Uh, we don't see growth coming back in a hurry. Whereas if you look at Asian economies like India and China, we are pretty much talking about at least an 8% growth in these regions. So as a conglomerate, which is probably more diversified than other Indian groups, how are you hedging your bets for growth? So like I said, about 50% of our revenue comes from outside of India. And that's pretty scattered. The biggest piece of that, of course, is uh, North America. But other than that, it's spread across Southeast Asia, Brazil, Egypt, um, Australia, uh, Canada. So I think that uh, the internationalization of uh, the businesses is in itself a de-risking strategy. And uh, if you are to achieve a 65 billion revenue target by 2015, how much of investment will you have to make in your different businesses? So I think, uh, you know, difficult to put a number to it. But uh, again, in terms of mix, I would think that uh, half that investment would be outside of the country. Mm -hmm. and the other half uh, in India. So I think the balance between overseas uh, and India will also remain more or less the same. And what sort of uh, organic growth will be witnessed in companies like Hindalco, your co-companies, Hindalco, Grafsen, uh, AB Nouveau, and, and also IDEA? So I think uh, each of the companies have uh, very clearly charted out plans uh, which are in the public domain. So for example, Hindalco will triple its capacity built over the last 50 50 years in the next uh, three years. IDEA is growing at a very fast pace. Um, it's, it will grow at about 20% this year as compared to an industry growth of about 10%. Uh, Nuvo, I, I think, has two very large components mm -hmm. to it. There's IDEA and there's financial services. So, for example, in financial services, we've more than quadrupled our uh, assets under management in the last three years. Mm -hmm. So I think that each of the businesses has some very specific and well thought through and well chartered uh, growth plans that we will see uh, playing out uh, in the next couple of years. And uh, you know, a lot of people were skeptical when you went ahead and acquired uh, Novellis for almost $6 billion. But now, of course, it's a phenomenal turnaround story. So what would you say is that one important lesson you learned about global acquisitions from the Novellis example? I think the fact that uh, you've just constantly got to be at it, consistency. 
um, the fact that uh, you really need to win over the confidence of uh, the team that comes along with the acquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to make them feel and genuinely believe that uh, everything you're doing is uh, uh, with the agenda of uh, creating value for the company that's been acquired. Uh, I think it's uh, important for uh, there to be an amalgamation of cultures. I, I think it's unrealistic and unfair to expect uh, people in the acquired company to completely assimilate mm -hmm. with uh, our culture. I think there has to be a good blend of both. And I think it's uh, brass tacks about, for example, cutting down expenses, productivity maximization, branding, uh, shutting down uneconomic plants, shifting uh, plants, let's say in our case, mm -hmm. to India, right. uh, leveraging on their huge uh, technology, so on and so forth. So I think it's a pretty um, uh, multi-pronged approach that we've taken in the case of Novellis. And Novellis has also proved to be a, a terrific acquisition simply because the money it has already paid back to Hindalco. This is 1.7 billion uh, in dividends. Now, going ahead, do you expect uh, this dividend payment to be sustained or do you actually see it accelerating in the years ahead? So, um, we raised 4 billion of equity in December last year, of which 1.7 billion came back to Hindalco as debt, which is uh, half the investment that uh, we had made in terms of equity investment mm -hmm. uh, in Novellis three and a half years ago. The new uh, debt covenants, given that uh, Novellis is today a much stronger company with a much stronger balance sheet, Acquire, uh, the new covenants uh, allow for fungibility of cash between Hindalco and Novellis. Um, so I think what has been achieved is that Novellis is uh, turning out cash and uh, Hindalco needs that cash. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of the major objectives of this refinancing that we've just done. And, but any plans to list Novellis in foreign markets? You know, Novellis has um, very strong operating cash flows. I think that uh, they can pretty much meet uh, their own growth plans mm -hmm. with their own internal approvals. So there is uh, no need to go and tap the equity market. So I don't see that happening. And you mentioned that Novellis is moving its uh, can body plant to, uh, from UK to Orissa. Uh, but I believe there's been some sort of uh, delay in that. I mean, one doesn't see too much movement, at least on the ground. Uh, what is your target for relocating the plant and getting it up and running and commissioning it in India? No, that's not true. We are bang on target. Uh, we will commission September of uh, this year. The more uh, important thing in terms of policy is now to focus on the m and guidelines because that potentially uh, can be a game uh, changing policy for uh, the industry. How do you expect this uh, fight which you have with DOT on this idea spice merger? How, how do you expect it to end? We are very open to uh, any option that they uh, recommend, if they want us to surrender license, we've kept that license in a virtual escrow. We haven't used that so-called excess license and we're very happy to surrender that. PG is a, a service that can give an edge to idea over competition. Mm -hmm.